What is the Bible? Is the Bible the Holy Word of God? Or is it a collection of myths and legends that have no relevance today? Does the Bible accurately record history? This debate can be heard everywhere. Thousands of voices can be heard shouting their opinions in the media around the world. The rhetoric is loud and filled with vitriol. In some corners of the world, blood flows and people die because of their views about God and the Bible. One might think I'm describing the events of today, and they would be right. But a walk through history would reveal the same bloody fingerprints of religious hatred and ignorance dating back to the days of Jesus. So, this is the question we will explore. Is the Bible the Word of God? Recently, while flying back to California with my wife, I sat next to a polite young man who noticed a book on church history I was reading. Shortly into our conversation, he looked at me and said, I do not believe the Bible is the Word of God. By the look on his face, he expected me to react in a certain defensive way but I surprised him with my reaction. I said, okay, let's take the Word of God issue off the table. Now, let's discuss what the Bible really is. The Bible is a collection of historical documents that need to be considered. For example, you have four biographies that chronicle the life of a man named Jesus Christ. I paused and I looked at this man and continued. Did Jesus really exist? Did he perform the miracles noted in these four Gospels? Did Jesus rise from the dead? These four Gospels demand an answer. this young man was stunned. He wanted to debate the Word of God issue, but he was not prepared to discuss the historical accuracy of these ancient manuscripts. The Word of God issue is a personal belief fostered by faith. I believe the Bible is the Word of God as an act of faith. But this young man flying with me also had a personal belief about the Bible that he also mixed with faith. By faith, I believe the Bible is the Word of God. But equally, my flying acquaintance, by faith, believe the Bible was not the Word of God. Each perception of the Bible required an act of faith. Faith is the key. Is my faith misplaced? Do the four Gospels accurately chronicle the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Can we trust the Bible as history? These are difficult questions to answer because history is subject to human observation and interpretation of the facts available. For nearly two millennia, the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were considered reliable historical texts. But this is not the case today. The true historical Jesus 
is under revisionist attack from organizations such as the Jesus Seminar, a group of 150 highly skeptical professors who challenged the orthodox historical concept of Jesus in the 1990s. They used a colored stone voting system to identify which sayings of Christ can be traceable back to the historical Jesus. They concluded that less than 20% of the sayings in the Gospels can be traceable back to the historical Jesus. This group used the same voting system to identify which events and miracles can be attributed to Jesus. It just so happened that this group of scholars approached their research from the point of view that miracles cannot happen, especially the resurrection of Jesus. The liberal anti-Christian bias of this group is without question. Greg Boyd, a Yale and Princeton educated scholar, in his award-winning book entitled Cynic Sage or Son of God, wrote that the Jesus Seminar was composed of an extremely small number of radical fringe scholars who are on the far, far left of New Testament thinking. This group became the media's fair-haired child that garnered considerable ink and airtime because of their radical assault on Jesus. Remember, in order for a thing to be newsworthy, it must be new. But new does not mean it's historically accurate. Dr. Craig A. Evans, the highly respected author on the history and languages of the New Testament said, if you're hoping to get on the network news, well, news has got to be new. Nobody is going to get excited if you say the traditional view of the Gospels seem correct. Publicity seeking radical left-wing scholars are becoming more outrageous with their distortions about Jesus and the Gospels of the New Testament. This is especially true with the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas unearthed with the Nag Hammadi Library in 1945. This work is the favored son of liberal scholarship, and it is reported to be a collection of 114 hidden sayings attributed to Jesus. Why is this newly discovered manuscript causing such controversy? Dr. Ben Witherington III of Ashbury Theological Seminary answered this question. The salvation offered in the Gospel of Thomas is clearly at odds with the salvation offered in the New Testament. There is no doubt the Gospel of Thomas and the Nag Hammadi Library is the work of the Gnostic heretical sect of the 2nd and 3rd century. But the Jesus Seminar would have us believe that this Gnostic work dates to as early as 50 AD. Dr. Craig A. Evans said, most of the material in Thomas parallels Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and sometimes Paul and other sources. Over half of the New Testament writings are quoted, paralleled, or alluded to in Thomas. You can't have a collection of convoluted sayings predate the New Testament that quotes large portions of the New Testament. That's not possible. It gets even worse. The Gospel of Thomas 
also quotes from the Ditesseron, a harmony of the Gospels authored by Tatian in 175 AD. How can the Gospel of Thomas be written around 50 AD but yet quote from Tatian's work? The answer is simple. It can't. The Gospel of Thomas must be dated later than 175 AD. Dr. Craig A. Evans reaffirms this statement when he said, Everything points to Thomas being written at the end of the second century, no earlier than 175, and probably closer to 200 AD. How can we trust the Jesus Seminar when their lust for media attention and their anti-Christian bigotry is blatantly obvious. The academic integrity of the Jesus Seminar is seriously in question by nearly 90% of gospel scholars around the world. Again, is the Bible history? I believe the answer is yes. At times the history of the Bible can be more important than its philosophy because history elevates the men and women of the Bible from the status of religious myth to historical reality. Did Pontius Pilate exist? The answer is yes. Too many Roman texts exist that reference the real Pilate. Did Caiaphas, the high priest, chronicled in the New Testament exist? The answer is also yes, because too many archaeological artifacts have been found that validate his place in history. Why be concerned about these two seemingly unrelated men from antiquity? The answer is simple. It was the life and ministry of Jesus that caused these men to have lasting historical value. We know of Pontius Pilate and Caiaphas from the four Gospels that chronicle the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. This is just one example of numerous events in history that are recorded in the Bible. Can we trust the Bible as history? I believe we can. But my opinion is not universally accepted by all students of history. This is especially true in the archaeological community. The Bible as history is a hot button issue filled with heated debate. The antagonism is most visibly seen in the biblical minimalist maximalist debate. Biblical minimalism began in the 1980s at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. The professors at this university argue that King David and King Solomon, as well as most men and women from the Old Testament, are mythical literary flights of fancy. These professors insist that the Old Testament has no real connection to Iron Age history. The Copenhagen School maintains that the Bible cannot be considered reliable evidence for the history of ancient Israel. The professors at the University of Copenhagen formulate their theory from an argument of silence. Since no archaeological evidence has been found that proves the existence of King David or Solomon, therefore these two men must be fictional characters like the mythical King Arthur. Well, an old axiom would fit now. An ounce of evidence trumps a pound of speculation. In 1993 and 1994, at Tel Dan, the Iron Age city of Dan, located in northeast Israel, an archaeological dig led by Avram Byram, 
of the Hebrew Union College in Jerusalem found several fragments of an Aramaic stella that mentions a king of the house of David. Well, you cannot have a house of David without having a David. I guess he is not as mythical as biblical minimalists thought. This is not the only case where minimalists have rejected a recent discovery that did not fit their secular politics and Bible prejudice. On August 4th of 2005, a late Mazer, an Israeli archaeologist affiliated with the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, announced the discovery of the palace of King David on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The issue that is causing contention is the fact that Elate Mazer used references from the Bible to identify the site of her archaeological dig. Mrs. Mazer is quoted as saying, I work with the Bible in one hand and the tools of excavation in the other, and I try to consider everything. The fact that Mrs. Mazer used the Bible to aid in her research has caused antagonism and contention in the archaeological community. Should she have used ancient cuneiform tablets or Babylonian artifacts, she would have been considered an archaeological genius. But since she used the Bible, she must be an archaeological amateur. The only problem the minimalists have is that each subsequent digging season has yielded more discoveries that confirm her identification of King David's palace. Do I believe the Bible accurately records history? Yes, I do. Over the years that I have followed the archaeological reports coming from the Middle East, I have formed one conclusion. There is more politics and prejudice in the archaeological community than true science. This point is clearly proven by the controversy caused by the James Ossuary. What is an ossuary? It is a depository for the bones of the dead. The custom of using an ossuary as a secondary burial box dates in Israel to the latter Second Temple period and ceased to be used after the destruction of the Temple in 70 AD by the Romans. This may be interesting, but why would a bone box dating from the first century AD cause such debate? The answer lies in the inscription on the box. It reads, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. The existence of the ossuary was announced in a press conference on October 21st of 2002 by the Biblical Archaeology Society. And this announcement generated considerable excitement around the world, but it seriously angered the Israel Antiquities Authority because they were not included in the discovery. The owner of the ossuary is Odin Golan, an antiquities dealer from Jerusalem. In 2003, the Israel Antiquity Authority determined that the inscription on the James ossuary was a forgery and in December of 2004, Odin Golan was charged with 44 counts of forgery, fraud, and deception. For nearly 10 years, the trial of Golan and the authenticity of the James Ossuary occupied the printed page and the media. On March 14, 2012, Golan was acquitted on all forgery charges. The ossuary came back into the public light again. 
Why did the Israel Antiquity Authority bring forgery charges against Odin Golan? The answer is simple. The James ossuary was probably looted from a burial cave and sold to Golan. The discovery of the James ossuary did not include the IAA. And they hate unprovenanced artifacts. Simply stated, the Israel Antiquity Authority does not like not being in control of all Israel artifacts. The question begging to be answered is this, is the James ossuary genuine? The inscription was authenticated by Adriel Lemaire and Adia Yardini, two world-class experts in paleography, and Father Joseph Fitzmaier, the world's leading expert in Aramaic. The Geological Survey of Israel found no reason to question the authenticity of inscription. The results from the scientific community is that the ossuary and inscription are genuine. Herschel Shanks, editor of the Biblical Archaeology Review, commissioned the world-renowned statistician Professor Chamomile Fucus of the Tel Aviv University to calculate the probability that the James on the ossuary was the brother of Jesus Christ. The report issued by Professor Fucus stated that, with 95% certainty, we can expect there to be 1.71 individuals in the relevant population named James with a father named Joseph and a brother Jesus. Are these statistics proof that the ossuary housed the bones of James, the brother of Jesus Christ? No, but they clearly point in that direction. Fox News reported on November 12th of 2013 that the Supreme Court of Israel ordered the IAA to return the artifacts seized during their trial of Odin Golan. Let's just say the James Ostuary was returned in less than perfect condition. According to the Fox News report, the ossuary was vandalized by the Israeli government. The inscription was defaced and contaminated. The IAA is not finished yet. Fox News also reported on a carved pillar discovered near Bethlehem that may be linked to King David or Solomon. This discovery was brought to the attention of the Israeli Antiquity Authority by the archaeologist Benjamin Tropper of the Kfar at Zion Field School. And he was told, that's great, now shut up. Due to the pressure generated by Fox News and other media outlets, the IAA finally acknowledged the discovery of the pillar, but would not discuss the matter further, expressing concern over the unavoidable relationship between archaeology and the Middle East conflict. When we talk about the Bible as history, it can be difficult to get to the truth because politics and Bible bigotry flavor so many opinions. To me, the Bible is history and all the bigotry in the archeological community has not robbed me of my faith and my Bible. I enjoy reading their theories, but I do not trust them because their bias is clearly seen. In the end, it does come down to faith. Why does the secular scientific community 
hold such disdain for the Bible? To me, the answer is simple. It's the doctrine of Bible inerrancy and the belief by countless millions that the Bible is the Word of God. Is the Bible the inerrant Word of God? The answer to this question is wrought with strong opinion and relentless debate. On one side of the Bible, we find poignant evangelical leaders, bibliographers, and historians, while on the other side, we see mainstream Christian theologians with their bibliographers and historians, each side set in their theories, refusing to listen to each other. Visualize a sliding scale. On the extreme right, we have the King James only people who are adamant that every single word in the King James Version of the Bible is the inspired Word of God. While on the extreme left, we have the doubting view that rejects divine inspiration and the historical accuracy of the Bible. Faith is the slider that dictates our position on the scale. As we move the slider to the right, the more we accept the Bible as the inerrant Word of God. But the opposite is also true. The more we move the slider to the left, the more we reject the Bible as the inerrant Word of God. Again, what is inerrancy? This is a complicated question because the issue of contention is how inerrancy should be applied to the Bible. On the extreme right of this debate is the King James only faction that is an ultra-conservative fundamentalist assembly who loudly sings the praises of the King James version of the Bible. The congregations in the KJV only camp adamantly teach that every English word in the King James Version of the Bible is divinely inspired and has absolutely no human fingerprint from cover to cover. The rhetoric coming from these religious people obstinately insist that the KJV is totally inerrant. It is exact and perfect to the smallest punctuation mark. While on the extreme left of this sliding scale is the opinion that the Bible is outdated and old-fashioned. The scholars in this camp spend more time and effort working to discredit the Bible than seeing the hand of God in its holy pages. In a way of speaking, both extremes are radical fundamentalists who examine the evidence of Scripture from predispositions. Neither side is willing to challenge their doctrinal biases. I believe James Nell Packer, a signer of the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy in 1978 and professor of theology at Regent College in Vancouver, British Columbia, made the most poignant and logical statement concerning the inerrancy of the Bible. He said, To assert biblical inerrancy and infallibility is just to confess faith in the divine origin of the Bible and the truthfulness and trustworthiness of God. Howard O.J. Brown wrote that infallibility may be called the subjective consequence of divine inspiration. That is, it defines the scripture as reliable and trustworthy to those who turn to it in search of God's truth. Consequently, it will never fail or deceive anyone who trusts it. 
I believe the autographs of the Bible comprise the inerrant Word of God in relation to mission and purpose. The mission of the Bible authors was accomplished. They factually and accurately portrayed the person and the teachings of Jesus Christ. God intended to use the Bible as a written revelation of the person of Jesus Christ. With this mission in mind, then the Bible would be the inerrant Word of God, because the revelation of Jesus is clearly seen on each page. To think that the Bible is all divine is to ascribe to the Holy Scriptures a spiritual authority that even Jesus does not have. The whole incarnation is predicated upon Jesus Christ being both true God and true man. Jesus had a human side that was subject to human frailty, but he also had a divine nature that God expressed himself through. The Bible has both a human element and a divine revelation. Do not stumble at the thought that the Bible has a human side because Jesus also had a human side. The Bible is inerrant in its mission of revealing the person of Jesus Christ. We must see that God's thoughts are not naturally our thoughts. God is not restricted to our human language to communicate His thought. When divine inspiration came to the Bible authors, it came in the form of divine thought. Through the divine guidance of the Holy Spirit, the Bible authors digested the thought of God until they could form that thought into human words. Therefore, the Bible is both true God and true man. The inerrancy of the Bible is seen in the divine thought communicated with human words. Have we made the Bible the fourth member of the Trinity? We believe the Bible is totally and completely divine. We reject the human element in the writing of Holy Scripture. By maintaining this belief, we fall into the same error of the Docetists of the early 3rd century, who taught that Jesus did not have a true physical body, but walked among us as a phantasm, an illusion of true reality. Bishop Serapon of Antioch, who authored this doctrine, only accepted the divine manifestation of Jesus, but rejected any human element. This doctrine was completely rejected by the First Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. To believe this doctrine is to deny the true incarnation, Jesus, both true God and true man. Do we commit the same error with the Bible? We accept its divine manifestation, but reject its human origin? The Bible must be seen in the same light as the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible is both true God and true man. Dr. Daniel B. Wallace, clearly summing up the inerrancy debate, said, If you doubt whether the Bible is an authoritative guide for faith and practice, it will inevitably affect your spiritual journey. You might begin questioning passages that are clear in their meaning, but they're too convicting for you, so you reject them. You begin to pick and choose out of the Bible what you want to believe and obey. Thus, infallibility and inerrancy are important for the health of the church, but are not essential for the life of the church. The preface of the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy beautifully presents a competent basis for understanding the Bible. The authority of Scripture 
is a key issue for the Christian church in this and every age. Those who profess faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior are called to show the reality of their discipleship by humbly and faithfully obeying God's written word. To stray from scripture in faith or conduct is disloyalty to our master. Recognition of the total truth and trustworthiness of Holy Scripture is essential to a full grasp and adequate confession of its authority. Is the Bible the Word of God? To millions of Christians, the answer is yes. But again, it comes down to faith. By faith, I believe the Bible is historically accurate and it is the Word of God. Every person must consider the historical Jesus presented in the four Gospels of the New Testament. So, the questions I have presented to my young traveling companion are just as relevant now as they have been throughout history. Did Jesus really exist? Did he perform the miracles noted in these four Gospels? Did Jesus rise from the dead? These four Gospels demand an answer. Some pundits of higher criticism such as the Jesus Seminar, begin their evaluation of the Bible from a presupposition that the Bible is a flawed historical document written by men, influenced by Jewish cultural norms and outdated traditions. In simple terms, the Bible is an erroneous book because the authors were filled with error. When these bibliographers and historians approach the Bible with such preconceived notions and theories, it should not be surprising when all their data reflect their prejudices. Be careful when you watch documentaries concerning books banned from the Bible or the lost secrets of the New Testament because the producers of these programs are counting on the fact that the viewers have no knowledge of the heretical sect from the second and third century known as the Gnostics. Why would the secular media care about Jesus Christ and the Bible? To me, the answer is obvious. To impact public opinion concerning the Christian Church and put into question the historical accuracy of the Bible. The political voice of a united Christian coalition of churches has impacted the political direction of the United States of America. Liberal Humanism must weaken the political resolve of Christianity in America. Therefore, the secular media has targeted the historical perceptions of Jesus Christ and the accuracy of the Bible. Devalue the preeminence of Jesus and nullify the historical accuracy of the Bible. Then the voice of Christian politics has been minimized. That is the goal of a liberal, secular media. Why be concerned about history? The answer is simple. Should the Christian church surrender the divinity of Jesus Christ to revisionist debate, then we have lost our Savior. How much of our Christian legacy and tradition will you surrender to secular historical revisionism? Remember the wisdom of George Santayana 
in his book, The Life of Reason. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it.